Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who in the Paschal mystery established the new covenant of reconciliation, grant that all who have been reborn into the fellowship of Christ's body may show forth in their lives what they profess by their faith through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Peter stood with the other 11 apostles. He raised his voice and declared, Judeans and everyone living in Jerusalem, know this, listen carefully to my words. Fellow Israelites, listen to these words. Jesus, the Nazarene, was a man whose credentials God proved to you through miracles, wonders, and signs, which God performed through him among you. You yourselves know this. In accordance with God's established plan and foreknowledge, he was betrayed. You, with the help of wicked men, had Jesus killed by nailing him to a cross. God raised him up. God freed him from death's dreadful grip, since it was impossible for death to hang on to him. David says about him, I, saw, I foresaw that the Lord was always with me because he is at my right hand, I won't be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. Moreover, my body will live in hope because you won't abandon me to the grave, nor permit your Holy One to experience decay. You have shown me the paths of life. Your presence will fill me with happiness. Brothers and sisters, I can speak confidently about the patriarch David. He died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this very day. Because he was a prophet, he knew that God had promised him with a solemn pledge to seat one of his descendants on his throne. Having seen this beforehand, David spoke about the resurrection of Christ and, he, and that he wasn't abandoned to the grave, nor did his body experience decay. This Jesus God raised up. We are all witnesses to that fact. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Protect me, O God, for I take refuge in you. I have said to the Lord, you are my Lord, my good above all other. All my delight is upon the godly that are in the land, upon those who are noble among the people. Those who run after other gods shall have their troubles multiplied. Their libations of blood I will not offer, nor take the names of their gods upon my lips. The Lord will show me the path of life. O oh Lord, you are my portion and my cup. It is you who uphold my lot. My boundaries enclose a pleasant land. Indeed, I have a goodly heritage. The Lord will show me the path of life. I will bless the Lord who gives me counsel. My heart teaches me night after night. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not fall. The Lord will show me the path of life. My heart, therefore, is glad, and my spirit rejoices. 
my body also shall rest in hope. For you will not abandon me to the grave, nor let your Holy One see the pit. You will show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy, and in your right hand are pleasures forevermore. The Lord will show me the path of life. A reading from the first letter of Paul. May the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ be blessed. On account of his vast mercy, he has given us new birth. You have been born anew into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You have a pure and enduring inheritance that cannot perish, an inheritance that is present, presently kept safe in heaven for you. Through his faithfulness, you are guarded by God's power so that you can receive the salvation he is ready to reveal in the last time. You now rejoice in this hope, even if it's necessary for you to be distressed for a short time by various trials. This is necessary th so that your faith may be found genuine. Your faith is more valuable than gold, which will be destroyed even though it is, is, it is itself tested by fire. Your genuine faith will result in praise, glory, and honor for you when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you've never seen him, you love him. Even though you don't know, you can't see him. Even though you don't see him now, you trust him and so rejoice with a glorious joy that is too much for words. You are receiving the goal of your faith, your salvation. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. It was still the first day of the week. That evening, while the disciples were behind closed doors because they were afraid of the Jewish authorities, Jesus came and stood among them. He said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. When the disciples saw the Lord, they were filled with joy. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father sent me, so I am sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you don't forgive them, they aren't forgiven. Thomas, the one called Didymus, one of the twelve, wasn't with the disciples when Jesus came. The other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he replied, unless I see the nail marks on his hands, put my finger in the wounds left by the nails, and put my hand into his side, I won't believe. After eight days, his disciples were again in a house and Thomas was with them. Even though the doors were locked, Jesus entered and stood among them. He said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. Look at my hands. Put your hand into my side. No more disbelief, believe. Thomas responded to Jesus, my Lord and my God. Jesus replied, do you believe because you see me? Happy are those who don't see and yet believe. Then Jesus did many other miraculous signs in his disciples' presence, signs that aren't recorded in this scroll, but these things are written so that you will believe that Jesus is the Christ, God's Son, and that believing you will have life in his name. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Open the ears of our hearts, Lord, that we might trust you and truly listen to your voice. Amen. The verse that stood out to me in our gospel reading today is this. Unless I see the nail marks in his hands, put my finger in the wounds left by the nails, and put my hand into his side, I won't believe. It is easy to hear these words in the 20th chapter of John's gospel and think of Thomas as an obstinate doubter, someone whose example we would not want to follow. I mean, who wants to be a doubting Thomas, right? Yet I have come to realize that such a negative view of Thomas is rather inaccurate. Instead of thinking of Thomas as Thomas the doubter, 
I have come to see him as Thomas the realist. It is because earlier in John, in the 11th chapter, we find that when Jesus decided to return to Judea to attend to his sick friend, Lazarus, Jesus' disciples protested, saying, Rabbi, the Jewish opposition, opposition wants to stone you, but you want to go back? And a few verses later we read, then Thomas, the one called Didymus, said to the other disciples, let us go too so that we may die with Jesus. Based on this narrative, I'd say that Thomas had no illusions about what was going on here. He knew they were not going to be able to change Jesus' mind, and he knew that the Jewish authorities were going to kill Jesus when they got the chance. Even so, he was determined to go back to Judea and die with him. He was realistic about what he saw coming. I have also come to view Thomas as Thomas the truth seeker. I think Jesus recognized this about Thomas as well. Why do I think this? Well, I'm glad you asked because I'm going to tell you. <laughs> well, it's because I realized that in John chapter 14, when Jesus uttered the well-known words, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus was actually addressing these words directly to Thomas. I am the way, the truth, and the life. It seems to me that Jesus recognized that Thomas really wanted to understand what Jesus was talking about, that Thomas really wanted to know the truth. Otherwise, I don't think Jesus would have answered Thomas in the way that he did. So in turning our attention back to the gospel reading for today, it is not hard to see why Thomas, as a realist and a truth seeker, would be cautious about believing the other disciples' report of Jesus being raised from the dead. Thomas knew Jesus was dead. I think it is entirely likely that Thomas was among those who had watched Jesus die. Otherwise, how would he have known about the wound in Jesus' side? A resurrection like this did not fit Thomas's map of reality. Yet eventually, Thomas did believe as we read this morning, after eight days, Jesus' disciples were again in a house and Thomas was with them. Even though the doors were locked, Jesus entered and stood among them. He said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. Look at my hands. Put your hand into my side. No more disbelief, believe. Thomas responded to Jesus, my Lord and my God. I don't think there ever, there could ever be a stronger confession, confession of belief in Jesus' resurrection than the one Thomas made that day. What we see here is Thomas the realist, Thomas the truth seeker, moved from doubt to belief. And we know from historical tradition that Thomas was also moved to obedience, which was exemplified in his life of faith as an apostle. The history of the early church that most of us are familiar with includes the story of the apostle Paul 
who traveled west along the Mediterranean preaching the gospel and planting churches. What you may not know is that while the Apostle Paul was traveling west, the Apostle Thomas was traveling east, spreading the good news of Jesus Christ and establishing churches as far away as southern India, where he arrived in what is modern day Kerala state in the year AD 52. Tradition says that the Apostle Thomas established seven churches in Kerala. The descendants of those churches are known today as the St. Thomas Christians or the Syrian Christians of India. There are many churches in the Middle East and in Southern Asia that also trace their origins to the Apostle Thomas. Some of these churches still use the Aramaic language in their liturgy to this day. In case you're not familiar, Aramaic is the language that was spoken by Jesus and the disciples. St. Thomas was eventually martyred in India in AD 72 near modern day Madras. Thomas is a perfect example of what Dietrich Bonhoeffer described in his book, The Cost of Discipleship, when he said, the road to faith passes through obedience to the call of Jesus. Bonhoeffer went on to say, the idea of a situation in which faith is possible is only a way of stating the facts of a case in which the two, the following two propositions hold good and are equally true. Only he who believes is obedient. And only he who is obedient believes. In the past few years, I've spent a lot of time thinking about the interrelationship between belief in obedience to the truth. As I see things now, there are two kinds of doubt. The first kind of doubt is this. People don't believe the truth because they don't want to obey the truth. I hope by now I have convinced you that this is not the kind of doubt that Thomas was engaged in. The second kind of doubt is this. People doubt because they want to verify they, that what they believe is true. This kind of doubt plays an important role in spiritual growth, because if we can't question what we believe to be true, then we can never correct our wrong beliefs. People who pursue the truth are people who are committed to living their lives according to the truth. To be clear, the two kinds of doubt is about our commitment to obeying the truth. Fundamentally, our willingness to believe the truth rests on our commitment to obeying the Lord. As Bonhoeffer said, the road to faith passes through obedience to the call of Jesus. This was absolutely the case with the Apostle Thomas. He was a realist and a truth seeker, which to my way of thinking are actually one and the same thing. Because of this, Thomas was able to modify his understanding of reality and embrace the truth of Jesus' resurrection. This is quite unlike people that don't believe and are unable to modify their understanding of reality because they don't want to obey. It reminds me of what M. Scott Peck wrote in his book, The Road Less Traveled, when he was discussing the need for people to modify their mental map of reality when it is found to be inadequate. Peck wrote, truth or reality is avoided when it is painful. We can revise our maps 
only when we have the discipline to overcome the pain. To have such discipline, we must be totally dedicated to truth. That is to say that we must always hold truth as best we can determine it to be more important, more vital to our self-interest than our comfort. Conversely, we must always consider our personal discomfort relatively unimportant and indeed even welcome it in the service of the search of truth. Mental health, and I would say spiritual health, is an ongoing process of dedication to reality at all costs. This is the Apostle Thomas's legacy, dedication to the reality of Jesus' resurrection at all costs. Let us follow Thomas' example. Let us embrace the truth of Jesus' resurrection and obey his call on our lives. As Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. This is our reality. The Lord is risen. Hallelujah. <laughs>